would like to help everyone feel welcomed and feel part of our group as the teachers of pronunciation, because as you know, we are tops. So today's really interesting lesson is going to be a workshop where we have to work a real workshop, super segmental lesson planning, a hands on workshop. And uh, let me have you all say hello to our top team. We have a top team. Randy? Hello, hello. And Jadine? Hello, hello. All right. Now, I'd like to let you know that Jadine is going to be one of our plenary speakers at the conference. And what conference is that? That's the state conference we hold annually with Katisal, for Katisal, of Katisal, normally in a face-to-face -face environment, but our second year virtually. We'll say more about that in just a moment. I wonder, of the people in our group today, how many of you are Katisal members and how many of you are guests? Why don't you write in the chat, member or guest? We can see how many members and guests we have. Very nice. And we can see we've got folks from up and down Northern Southern California and in the middle and all the way across the US of A in Florida and across the Atlantic Ocean in Europe. So welcome all of you to our session. Those of you who are members know that you can benefit from many things as a member. And those of you who are guests may consider becoming a member because you could be a part of our whole vibrant community of California teachers of English to speakers of other languages. And as you might know, we put out a peer reviewed language publication called the Katisal Journal, which is open source and available to everyone to read. All you have to do is pull down uh, something on our website that says journal, and then you can get all of the journals that we have published in digital format. We also have our monthly Katisal update announcements sometimes at least once a month, but sometimes more often on things that are going on that relate to the teaching of English and uh, the things that we're doing within the Katisal community. As a member, you have discounts to our various conferences, regional and state conferences, and you have free access to an unlimited number of interest groups, levels, and chapters. So interest groups, we have now we have 12 interest groups. And guess what? Which one is the most active? We are, tops. we are, we are tops, right. And we do a lot of stuff. Teaching of pronunciation. We like to talk a lot and share information about research, and resources and methods and materials and a lot of scheming and what to do when we're teaching and learning pronunciation, especially related to English language learners. Well, if you're a member, you get to have interaction and networking and learning and teaching with all kinds of members who are not all necessarily living in California. Some of our members are living far away, but they know that Catisol is really a cool place to be. We have a lot of online discussion opportunity on our message board. If you're looking for a job, we have a job bank. You have some access to money, awards, awards for both established teachers and for those who are students who want to become teachers. There are different types of awards and grants available. Coming up, we have our state conference. And our state conference is going to be held this time an unusual way. It's going to be held on two weekends. So this is to sort of keep us away from Zoom Doom, where we're there for four days in a row. We're splitting it up. So we have pretty much like a half day on Friday and then all day Saturday, October 29th and 30th. And then we have some rest from Zooming and we come back the following Friday and Saturday, November 5th and 6th. 
So in the chat, you can see the link to find out more information about the conference that's coming up and it will lead you to registration. Now, early bird registration is still on. That means you can save a, a few dollars than if you wait until later. All right, but today, what did you come for? You came for Miss Allison McGregor, Dr. McGregor. She and I met, uh, how many years ago did we meet? Some years ago. Some years ago. <laughs> some years ago we met because we are pronunciation junkies, right? Would you say that? That we yes. are like, we love to talk about pronunciation and teach pronunciation, all that kind of stuff. So we belong to this little group called the uh, super, which is a super segmental kind of focus group of pronunciation um, providers, provocateurs, published folks, and all of that. And we met at, at this and at some other, we've been in some other conferences together, right? Like TESOL. TESOL and maybe PSLLT, which is definitely, what is that called? Pronunciation in second language, second language. learning and teaching. Did I get all the letters for that one? Mm -hmm. so that one is not just about English. That's about teaching pronunciation to anyone in any kind of language. So that's, it's a little bit broader yet narrow, narrow in the way of pronunciation, but broader in the terms of different languages. And she's now at Princeton University. What do you do at Princeton? I'm in the English language program and I yeah. work with international graduate students mm -hmm. and postdocs. Yes. And there are some people in our audience who also work with graduate students. So they may be interested in what you have to say about helping them get a hold of super segmentals and how you can kind of fashion a lesson. Because we always think of, wow, everything's so, there's so much to learn and there's so much to teach. How do we focus on something? So let me give you the floor. In fact, you go ahead and share your screen and let us all know how to do it. All right, thank you so much, Marsha. It's exciting to be here with fellow pronunciation and super segmental enthusiasts. Warm welcome to teachers around the globe. Uh, thank you for your time today and being brave enough to tackle the topic of super segmental lesson planning hands-on workshop on a Friday afternoon or maybe a different time zone for you. Quite late in Europe, I know. So I wanted to mention a little bit about my motivation for today's workshop. Um, I want to kind of just experiment with um, instructional decision making revolving around super segmentals. I think the way that we approach something has a direct um, impact, obviously, on the results. And in trainings about super segmentals, there's often a lot of information about what they are and the characteristics and features. Um, but sometimes, uh, which is all really important and that we are, there's always more to learn. Uh, but I think for me, I've often kind of grappled with the, the teaching aspect. And um, I hope today what we can do is grapple together with this overwhelming topic and that I'll be able to hopefully we'll all walk away with some ideas, food for thought, maybe a lesson plan, hopefully a, learn, a lesson, um, a learning objective or an activity uh, and in the pursuit of helping our students be understood. So we're gonna jump right in with an activity and what I'd like, hope everyone has a pen, a pencil, a little paper beside you and this is not a test. If you read the blurb and you brought it, have, have in your mind already a task or an activity, well done, A++. If not, don't worry. We have a minute here to uh, catch up and, and brainstorm these topics. So each of these bubbles represents just something about your classroom and you're the expert on your classroom. So think about What's a task or activity that we're leaving aside super segmentals now just think about what are you doing in your classroom? Uh, what do you want the students to do and what's their 
a little bit about the learners. What's their proficiency level? What are their needs? What this might look like, just to give you an example, I was talking with an ESL friend of mine who actually lives in California. Mm-hmm. And I said, hey, what are you teaching tomorrow? And she said, present progressive. And then quickly followed up with um, present progressive, probably doing some role plays, uh, knowing that I am a speaking, speaking, listening, and pronunciation teacher. She's more of a grammar teacher. Uh, and making note that her context is very different than mine. She was, um, her learners are immigrants, mostly Spanish speakers. And it was very interesting. She said in talking to them, she's met them only a couple of times. She said they really want to be fluent and understood. I thought, all right, great. That's some good information. So let's go to your classroom and your context. Think of an activity. So I'm going to get my phone here. You have one minute. And I want you to think about a teaching activity. Try to be as specific as possible. Um, Kind of narrow it as as much as you can. And then jot down, just think about your learners. Who are they? What do you think their needs are? Where are you in your class, maybe in your curriculum? Just one minute. All right, there's our one minute. Would any brave souls like to share what your what your bubbles look like? Raise your hand or just unmute and fire away. Randy? Oh, okay. So my students are international teaching assistants. And an activity that I want to have them do this quarter, um, this term at UCSB is to have them give a short presentation. But when they're doing that, they have to identify which are the difficult words, um, not difficult for them to pronounce necessarily, but difficult for their audience because it's a new word or a technical word. Then they have to b- slow down and learn how to articulate that word um, at half speed d- rather than just rattling it off the way they normally do when they're talking with you know, their other professors and graduate students. Great, great. All right, nice, very specific. All right, so everyone keep those, uh, your notes handy. We're going to use these as a, this information as a launch pad for the three activities that we'll be diving into in today's workshop. So the first activity is gonna revolve around Uh, just brainstorming what are the possible super segmental related targets that we could do in this context or your your context uh, and then kind of narrowing it and selecting some some targets and then we'll follow that up by kind of stopping and pausing and thinking about the learning process and um, where the learners might be in the process what do what do they need what stage are they in the in the learning process And I should mention that um, the second part of this uh, workshop is based on a a co-authored book chapter. I want to mention my my co-author, Veronica Sardinia. Uh, We've just finished a chapter on classroom research on L2 pronunciation. And we analyzed like the last five years of classroom research and kind of pulled out from there, what what are we finding in the research? And so there's some really interesting things about um, the, instructional building blocks. And so we'll cover that. Uh, and then we'll launch that. So, so narrowing down into writing um, the super segmental related objectives for your class. So you'll be able to walk away with, with those. All right. So it seems that this is the easy part, all nice and tidy and organized, but next part is a little bit messy. Right? So the messy part is Super segmentals. <laughs> what are the definitions? What are they? So everybody just go open your chat. And when you think of super segmentals, I want you to just put in chat, what, what words come to mind? What features? Just fire away. Let's see how much we can go. So 30 seconds, everybody just put in the chat. When you think of super segmentals, what comes to your mind? Intonation, great. Solid, ooh, phrasing, yes, love it. Rhythm, word, stress, pitch, yes, yes, yes all over it. Multiple. Yes, there are so many. (laughs) That's a good one. Comprehensibility pitch. Nice. Focus. Absolutely. Content and functional words getting very specific. Excellent. 
Nice, some techniques here, humming. Chunking, nice meta language for our learners. Prominence. Linking, I was once told that linking is technically not a super segmental, um, but it, it, it pairs very well with them. All right, great, nice work. Let's look at the definitions that we have from phonetics. So basic definitions, right, we know extends over the syllable more than a segmental. From ESL research, if you really go into it, it's often in brackets, super segmental is stress, rhythm, and intonation. And lots of us already are using the word prosody or prosodic features, somewhat of a broader term, but often used synonymously with super segmentals. This explains what super segmentals are, but it doesn't really touch on how they work. And so I want to think a little bit deeper about the essence. What is the essence of super segmental features? To me, the very essence of super segmentals is a syllable, and the syllable is having an identity crisis because the poor syllable doesn't know, like, what is it supposed to do? All the features revolve around the syllable. How long am I supposed to be? Where is my pitch? Um, how many strings of syllables should be together? Where do I, where am I in relation to the other syllables around me? <laughs> um, yeah, how long should I be? How short should I be? Um, should I stick out? Should I blend in? Should I connect to the, the syllable beside me? Another aspect in more thinking about not only what it is, but how they work, um, the, the terminology of segmental versus super segmental has a weakness uh, because it puts us in opposition and it doesn't really embrace the nested nature of super segmental. And in fact, the field is moving away from this debate because we realize this nested nature. And uh, if you've never thought about it, think about if, if the essence of super segmentals is a syllable, what's in the middle of a syllable, a vowel? Well, a vowel is a segmental, obviously, right? So, and these are all nested, right? The vowels in the syllable, the syllable is in a word, the word is in a phrase and so forth. And so this is kind of based on also on prosodic hierarchy and the way that learner um, first language acquisition occurs, that we, we learn some of the really basic tools and then it, the, the features get bigger. And it's, it's a way of thinking about scaffolding instruction, I think. Another um, key aspect, I think for teachers, instead of thinking about just what super segmentals are, is thinking about teaching. In teaching, what are we doing in teaching? We're always working with vocabulary. Randy mentioned his key terms for his ITAs. Uh, we're oftentimes moving students from beginner level to intermediate level to advanced level. So we're working on development of fluency, the fundamental thing. Uh, you might, in your context, you might be working on grammar or um, you're flipping through the textbook and there's a dialogue or you're flipping through the textbook and there's some other activity uh, and thinking, okay, so how does this relate to the super segmentals? But the features you could see here in the table that, that super segmentals really uh, will support the development of almost anything that we're doing in the language classroom because they're such an integral part of, of language and, and language development. I realize I'm probably preaching to the choir. We all know they're so important. The, the, the problem is how do we do it, right? Let's go back to our um, example and our activities. So with my friend, we started talking about, well, Let's just brainstorm what, what would be the possible things, super segmental related, that we could integrate into the class. Um, so for present progressive role plays, well, there might be questions, right? So question intonation, that's a standard one. Um, obviously, there's going to be sentences, so that might include, or that could include, right? You could integrate thought groups, you could integrate stress intonation and rhythm, uh, because of the level that there are, they are a little bit lower, you're wanting them to get, you know, pushing them to the next level, definitely you want them to have a, be able to say a sentence. Oftentimes in that developmental stage, you're only be able to get out a word or two words at a time. Uh, and 
this this really key beautiful part here is they want to be fluid and understood so again we're thinking about thought group stress intonation so here um, we've collected a lot of possibilities um, naturally this is overwhelming we can't do everything so we need we need to sort of pare it down and prioritize just thinking about this go ahead and put in the chat what what would you work on what would you prioritize in this in this example Great. Marika said thought groups. Exactly. So um, you can see that that was that was kind of a, a, a heavy hitter, right, in terms of the learners needs, in terms of their proficiency level, uh, in terms of doing the, the, the activity. So having students do the role play focus first maybe the learning objective is accuracy in your present progressive forms uh, but then maybe following it up or giving feedback um, on on thought groups not everything but thought groups or depending on on the learners what what they could handle next so let's go back to your tasks and activities and i'd like you to walk through this same process. So we're going to go into breakout rooms. You'll be there for about five to seven minutes and tell your partners uh, your activities, a little bit your proficiency levels, the students, and then kind of brainstorm together what would be the possible features of Super Seminal that you could work for. And then see, like, could you dial it down, right? Can we narrow the focus to make it a little bit more manageable in, in the time frame that you have and meeting the needs of the learners? In our breakout rooms, one more time, tell us what we're supposed to do. So you're in, we're going to go into the breakout rooms. You are going to um, share the task that you have decided on. So your own task, uh, the first from the very, from the warm up activity. Uh, and then you're going to brainstorm just like we did in the previous. So this idea is the brainstorming. This brainstorming, what are the possible that connect to some of the things that relate to your learners? And then see if you can narrow the focus and sort of say, okay, I think I'm going to prioritize this because I can't do everything. You're brainstorming the different possible super segmental targets, and then you're going to narrow and prioritize the focus of the super segmental targets. Remember, there's no right or wrong answer. We're just to uh, yeah. see, see how it goes. And well, okay. when we come out, we'll, we'll grapple with the answers and see okay. what, we, what we come up with. Um, Marcia just popped in. She's got a wonderful activity on exactly that. Um, that's the flat. I'm teaching the fly swatter activity, Marcia. My students go berserk for the fly slaughter game. Oh my gosh, there's the video of it on YouTube. They love it. I I don't know if PhD Ch or Chinese PhD students in the Netherlands would appreciate it as much as my students do because it's kind of fun and rambunctious, but it's a great oh, way to teach that. Who are your that. students? Well, I was talking about my students, the, the, the Chinese PhDs here in the Netherlands. So we do uh, the standing up for uh, or the stressed syllable, yeah, and also uh, the full vowels that are not stressed, stretching the arms out and reduced syllable, to just sit down. So I would like to them to learn that system and and to connect it with the color coding. But I'm not sure if I got your video right, Lisa. Because what did you name the video that Marcia has been doing? It's, yeah, this good. Look up Marcia Flyswater game on YouTube. Flashed. No, Marcia uh, Flyswater. Uh, Fly, well, okay, so if you go to my channel, which is Pronunciation Doctor on yes. YouTube, there is uh, there are lots of playlists. So mm -hmm. one of the playlists is called um, Pronunciation Games. Yeah. All right, so if you go to Pronunciation Games, you'll see a, a whole series of fly swatter games um, that emphasize 
you're going to target different aspects of pronunciation, including syllables. But, I don't get that first part. Flies, water. Yeah. Okay. Do you know what it is when you have flies? I'll go get one. Want to kill them? So here, I'm going to write it in the chat. Oh, okay. And it's fly the. Oh, flies, insect. water. Do you know what sloth. I thought you were saying? I thought you said flies water. Yes, of course. If you don't have the context, <laughs> it could mean something like that. But it's actually oh. fly <laughs> that. Which I have these in my teaching supplies. Yes. Oh wow! Yes. Well, I I, I really they, like. They it. have to on the emphasized syllable. Oh, I see. Pronunciation. Yes. So, hamburger. So yeah, it's great. So yeah. If you do it in a way that is a team sport, then they can be part of the team and then they have to do it by speed. So how fast can they react to hearing and identifying correctly the syllable that's stressed? So that's if you do the fly swatter for the stressed syllable, but you yeah, can do yeah, that yeah, for yeah. a lot of different. So if you look up that playlist, you'll see different ways that you can do the yeah. fly swatcher, fly swatter. I put sentence or word focus, emphasizing words and de-emphasizing mm, words. Yes. Could you do a fly sweater game for sentences? I, I think it might, it might be possible if you, um, I would say that that would come after you've done something about syllables. Yes. You, basically you introduce the idea, the concept of how you play this game and then you're going to extend it to something. Which of these words takes the stress and then you have to decide if you're going to only get the word or if you're going to be even pickier and get the syllable in the word september mm -hmm. for example i mean you can make that suggestion Karen, we have a word from you. um yeah i was thinking too about um about sentence focus and sentence stress so I, I'm starting a new job, but there were research, international researchers um, at a hospital, at a teaching hospital mm. here. Lots of multisyllabic words. When I taught at a hospital, they had so many multisyllabic words. It's lots oh, of fun. <laughs> yeah, so I- It I, could be on hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> it will be inoculation. Oops, I think we better... That's right. Okay, we gotta go back to the big group. All right. Let's uh we'll reconvene later. All right, welcome back, everybody. Yeah. Would anyone like let me invite some anyone to share um your 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 focus. How did how did it go? Or questions about the, the process? What came up? Ooh, yeah, our group had lots of things to say. Let somebody speak. <laughs> oh, maybe I can share some some things, Alison. Go ahead. Um, I was talking about my Chinese PhDs here in the Netherlands. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Their need was to be understood, basically, and be confident about their pronunciation. Uh huh. 
-hmm. especially when it comes to uh, uh, pronouncing keywords in their research and mm -hmm. where to put the stress. Mm -hmm. so, so get the head round word stress. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I introduced a, a system of color coding, but also embodying uh, word stress with the, the total body movements. And I thought while I was uh, writing it down that maybe highlighting or narrow it down first to the stress syllable mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, doing exercises uh, for that uh, part. Good. So, so that's very already yeah, very specific. So you've narrowed yeah. your, your super segmental focus to word stress. Um, and I guess the, the question is really for word stress, there might be two aspects, the, the placement, are they on the right, the right yeah. placement? And then of course the production. So yes, right. how are they producing the accuracy in the, in the production? So two pieces, their placement and, and production. Yeah. So great. That's fairly targeted. All right. Um, we started talking about, and then Marsha came in. <laughs> and then yeah. we we talked about a, a fly swatter activity that also Lisa uh, introduced uh, something about uh, embodying word stress with with a hitting a fly on the wall on the stress syllable. Marsha, am I right? Uh, yes, I think that is right. Is is being able to hear a multisyllabic word and identify which of the syllables is the stress syllable and going whoosh, on a target, which is on your board and uh, have teams, two teams do this so that they can see and do it quickly and build points for the red team. And Great. The yeah. So um, this actually is a very nice lead in. Thank you uh, to our next. So hold on to your your ideas. Um, I want to keep going so we can fit in the next two activities and then we'll have more time for Q&A at the end. Um, so let's go to this idea of thinking about how we're teaching um, and what we're doing and why we're doing these activities. So the Research shows us that theory-driven and evidence-based pronunciation instruction works. Um, and by theory-driven, what I mean is the research studies are based on some kind of theoretical perspective or a hypothesis, right? So we have noticing hypothesis. Students need to notice uh, the, the feature. They need input, so information and examples, lots of input. Um, and they need, this is a, a rather newer one, they need a skill development process. So skill development theory, explicit instruction creates this procedural knowledge, this automaticity, making um, the, the process automatic. Now, I know you might be thinking, um, okay, Allison, that sounds great, that's theory, but what do we do? Um, and so glad you asked. We have found in the research literature, most studies that have positive impact on pronunciation instruction, um, they really revolve around these five key instructional building blocks. Many of you have you've probably already heard them, but I think it's worth kind of just um, thinking and constructing this learning process in our mind of five building blocks. So awareness raising, right? it's pretty hard to um, work on something if you're not aware of it. Right? And so this is creating a discovery process, a noticing process, perceptual training as, as um, the fly swatter activity would test, right? Can they hear which syllable and they perceive the syllable that is stressed? Uh, explicit information, right? giving them concrete information about the, the speech features, going back to uh, my friend's example of the thought groups. Do they know that thought groups even exist? Do they know that they're usually one to seven syllables? How many syllables? Um, that they're stretches of speech? that you call them chunks. Uh, so meta language to create the understanding of what they're what they're going after. Uh, and then of course, the corrective feedback. So obviously, it's really difficult to change something if you don't know, <laughs> don't know that uh, what's what's going wrong or how to how to change it and refine it. So any thoughts or questions on these building blocks or kind of this, this um, flow of a learning process?
I, can I just say something, Alison? I think it's great to, to see these building blocks just in a row, which gives this idea of a sort of linear process. Whereas I think when you really work with the students, it's not as it's linear, not linear. As it looks, is it? <laughs> no, but it's great to, 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 to be presented with them like, you, like you're doing now. But can you say something about the, 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 the process that you're usually in? Uh, yes, stages? yes, How yes. I, I agree, Marika. I think it's it's it's. Um, I struggle with this in my mind too, because in my mind I try to create a linear process, and um, in terms of prioritization and identifying, you know, like what process am I leading my students through? You know, I want to take them by the hand and walk them through a process. Um, but naturally, uh, there are lots of interplay. Right. You can use explicit, especially with adult learners, I think you all mentioned ITAs, AEP classes. You can use explicit information or corrective feedback to raise awareness. You could use explicit information in order to um, help perceptual training, you could tell them what to listen for. Um, if you um, yeah, so these in, in terms of the practice. Um, that's they have to be able if they're practicing and you want them to be able to notice if it's accurate or not that's perception right can you perceive that you're pronouncing it accurately or not so you know what to change um, are you using the information so absolutely these are actually um, when you're going through the process i think you can combine some of these uh, mix in a mixed chaotic way but it is systematic in the sense that um, you're still leading them through a, a journey. The journey is, right, are you aware? Can you hear it? Do you know what you're supposed to do? And how is the practice probably scaffolded, right? Or the practice should be uh, focused on an easy task. So they have some sense of success, a little bit more difficult, uh, maybe some drill and practice, but then moving also, eventually you have to do um, some unstructured practice. Thank you for that, Alison. Yeah. Well, um, Seth has right. something to say. Oh, go ahead. Oh, hi. That reminds me also of um, uh, verifying that the students implement or apply the feedback. You know, they, they receive feedback, but then I want to make sure that they're applying it properly and, you know, producing the, what we're aiming for and then maybe reevaluating it. Right. What yeah. they do with feedback is a great question, um, well, but it's really two parts. I think you're touching on um, uptake. Right. Do they do they take it in? <laughs> do, uh, do, they, do they take it in? Do they understand it? And then do they use it? What do they do with it? Um, and, and those are um, processes and it, it actually relates to a lot of different things. Right. Motivation for the students. Um, also strategy training. Um, also the structure, right? Do you have follow-up activities that actually, you know, ask them to incorporate or do they revise? You know, um, sometimes that's easier than, than uh, easier to do than other times. So let's just take a minute and think about um, where are your student, where are your, your learners in the process? So remember you picked a, a very specific activity um, and you thought and kind of narrowed your focus. So Marika, for example, if I could take your example of the word stress placement in production, you might want to think about, right? So just this process. So are they aware? Of course, probably they are now because they're working with you, <laughs> but <laughs> how, how aware are they, right? And, and can they perceive it? What do, do they know, especially Mandarin speakers, do they know the difference between tone and English word stress? Usually it's not, they've never been taught this. Um, can they practice by themselves? Yeah, so make a few notes. I'll just give you a minute to make a few notes about where your learners are in the process. Recognizing that it's kind of linear, but you may touch on multiple building blocks. All right, let's keep these things again right in your mind and at hand, and we're going to add the final piece now. So I don't know that many teachers that um, really enjoy writing learning objectives. 
uh, they're difficult, uh, but objectives really help us wrangle right, our efforts and kind of pinpoint instruction and they pinpoint our feedback, especially with super segmentals. I think it's overwhelming, right? Like what, what, are, we, what are we giving instruction on? How, how much instruction and where do we, where do we start with the feedback? Um, and so quick review, right? With our learning objectives, usually we have a behavior. What do we want the students to do? Some kind of condition. Um, is, it, is it in a, a dialogue? Is it in a presentation? Is it, um, and the criteria is obviously something that can be measured. So to what degree, to what extent are they, are they required to do it? So just as an example for the workshop here today, you can see my verbs that I chose were create and refine. So, so I hope that after this presentation or workshop, you'll be able to create and refine or and or refine your super segmental related learning objectives using a research informed approach tailored to your own um, learning context and for measurable improvement. Now, am I going to measure it? No. <laughs> Um, do I hope that you notice some change? That would be great. All right. So when we're thinking about behaviors, if we want to tie our um, instruction to evidence-based teaching practices, which I think we all do, um, we can tie our objectives to these five key building blocks. So you can see on the top here, um, I have the building blocks and I'm have listed in the columns verbs that basically turn that con concept, right? The, the building blocks are kind of concepts or kind of activities, but they really narrow the focus into a behavior or an action, right? What is the action that the, the, the learner is going to do? So just as an example, um, going back to the beginning where we started, I would uh, go back, uh, several of you were talking about this um, ITAs and uh, field specific vocabulary. I also work with lots of Mandarin speakers, placement and production is, is a major challenge. And I can think about lots of different aspects of super segmentals, but word stress, placement, and production. So I can come to then a, a learning objective, which is I want my students to be able to define because I want them to have knowledge. I'm kind of, that's the testing of the knowledge and produce right, the production and be able to repair. I want them to be able to notice it and repair it. Um, my condition is 40 field specific words independently with 85% accuracy. And then do I measure the 85% accuracy? No, actually I don't. Um, but it does give me um, kind of a framework for when I'm listening to recordings and their, their um, top 10 lists, uh, some, some, some degree of, of certainty of what I'm looking for. All right, so you know what's next. Our final activity. So I'll give you two, three minutes here. Go ahead and contemplate what verbs would you choose for the behavior? So think back to that second activity. Where are your learners in the process? What are, what are really the key things that they need in terms of where they are right now? What do they need? And match it to a verb and then a condition and a criteria. So I'll be quiet. You can write if you if you if you wordsmith it and you're feeling happy with it. Uh, brave souls, feel free to pop it in the chat, and we'll take a look at them together. Okay, I'll share something that I wrote, um, and my target audience is adult. English learning child care providers. Mm -hmm. And they are probably um, kind of beginning and advanced beginning. They get along, but they don't speak English that fluently or that well, but they often use maybe native language in talking to parents. And now they're trying to improve their ability to speak English with parents of children who they care for with each other and so forth. So I wrote this, um, students will be able to identify the keyword in each phrase of a dialogue typical 
of an interaction between child care providers. Pronounce it with accurate syllable, syllables and stress um, during a live performance of said dialogue. So um, for pronounce, maybe just looking at the verbs. Yeah. Marcia, so um, maybe, maybe, I mean, this is just a minor, but um, Go ahead. produce or, well, could be produce or use or apply. Maybe even repair if they're, depending on, on the aspect that you're expecting them to be able to, to recognize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think I like the condition that's very specific to their context. So condition. So rather than specific. saying pronounce, you like produce better? Just, yeah, because what is, what is, yeah. I mean, you can use pronounce, that's fine. And repair. Monitor Great. and repair, all of those things, yeah. <laughs> well, so the it, it, depending on like how, how much, so here's where it's like, how much time do you have? Is it realistic? Um, maybe yes. starting all of those things maybe, have to be taken into can yeah maybe pairing it down for yeah. this specific activity just maybe one aspect of it or if they are able to do this then adding to you know just adding to the next one adding to the next as they they um, proceed okay, okay so we have another one here um in the chat students will be able to divide their prepared speech into thought groups identify the most prominent part in the each thought group and produce the right tones on them. Hmm. Any thoughts here? Hi, yeah. Um, I personally, I think, would break this um, SLO down into maybe three or four sessions and start with um, maybe working with a script and marking or dividing up um, speech into thought groups and then uh, marking the prominent or focus words and then work on production as, as in, a, in a separate lesson. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, so the condition is on their prepared speech. Is that right? Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. Um, yeah. And I try yeah. to formulate the goal, uh, yeah, based yeah. on the context that was presented within our group. So it's not yeah. like my activity, but yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I think uh, one of the challenges might be so produce the right tones. Um, and again, this is just nitpicky and only trying to flesh out what are we talking about, right? So what are right tones? Are we talking about um, that? It, and and med, med, adding something measurable. So if it's the right tones, I might like 50% of the time hitting the prominence <laughs> or uh, I mean, depending again on your learners, what, what criteria um, are, are, are we looking at? Um, yeah, and, and I would also actually for this, I would really be curious to see like backing up, where are the learners in the process? So um, if I'm able to do this, this means, so if I'm the learner, I, I'm, I, I, if I can divide the thought groups, it means I have explicit understanding of what mm -hmm. a thought group is. I know the rules or guidelines about where to pause. Um, that's a lot, I mean, that, that's great. That I would love if my students did that. Um, that's a lot to cover. Uh, do, they, do, they, do they really know where to pause? Um, have yeah and then for production have they um uh, do they know what stress is do they have they studied the rules of where to to stress um there's just so much information in the background um can they produce stress accurately in a key word just at the word level um sometimes working at the word level can be used as a launch pad to uh, so if production is a problem in sentences it's probably a problem in um word level um and if not then you can use that as a launch pad okay you're doing it right here uh where yeah great here's a couple oh, more oh, go ahead mm -hmm. yeah, well, no, i just was really between practice and feedback because they you know it's right quite advanced students uh mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So yeah, practice, yeah, 
Thank that you. sounds great. So that's one of the things is you have to just, you have to, yeah, you've identified uh, your students in this example as much more advanced than students that I was targeting. And so they've already gotten da, 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 a lot of foundation that um, on the word level that you can go on to things that are of longer utterances. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. All right, let me wrap up and then we can come back to any lingering um, thoughts or comments. So today's workshop, what I was hoping to highlight is that our super segmental instruction, it, it's tough, but we can integrate it into almost anything that we do in the classroom and that striving for evidence-based instruction by using five, um, even just the five instructional building blocks can be helpful. Uh, and hopefully you'll be able to um, keep grappling with these and refining super segmental related learning objectives to support your ultimate learning goals for your students. So thank you so much for your time today and I'm happy to entertain any remaining questions. Great, well, let's open up the mics. Yes, come on, teachers of pronunciation, don't be shy. Now's the time for you to speak up and tell more about what you think of this presentation and if it's engaging you in thought about things that you'd like to share. I just like to say that, you know, looking at the, the five sort of stages is a really good help. Those those instructional building blocks, I think it's really wonderful. And as we all know, and we've said that, you know, it's not all as linear as that, but we kind of go back and cycle and recycle and, you know, do our spiral. I mean, that's what we do as teachers anyway. We're always like feeding back and, and then bringing in more things. And I think it's really helpful. And this last exercise where you're having us do the SLOs, I mean, uh, those of us who have had to write SLOs for all of our courses and so forth um, know how hard it is, but it, but how useful it is um, and, and uh, how it is, how important it is so that um, you don't feel like, oh my goodness, pronunciation is such a big thing. How do I handle it? But if you can hone in on to the different aspects of pronunciation and then uh, determine where your students are and where they need to go and, and make some selections, be judicious about where you want to target your instruction, then you can narrow it down and build these SLOs which can be very useful and you know that you're getting you're gaining a way of of helping students move along in a certain yeah. aspect of this yeah um marjorie what your um doug's uh, comment in the chat just kind of launches uh, or is similar to what you were mentioning that um a teacher the teacher's cognition right your own ability to um think about the features, think about the process, assess the, so be able to recognize what's going on with the learners, what are the learners needs. If, if you don't know what the learners need, then that's, that's really um, uh, challenging. And if it's any comfort, there's about 20 years of um, teacher cognition on pronunciation research where teachers confess that they feel not confident with super segmentals and intonation and stress and they find them difficult to teach, lack, um, which is why I think um, all of us, none of us have anything to be ashamed about that, that, all, that teaching in general is challenging and this area is very challenging. It's hard, I think, to get training in um, the, the features and perceiving the features. What am I, what am I noticing? What, what are those, what are those features? What is going on with um, the, the students? Does it? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Seth. You oh, have the floor. Thanks. Yeah. No, I just, and, um, what I'm thinking is I think it's important when programs, ESL programs are able to have um, courses specifically in pronunciation because sometimes uh, it may vary from program to program, but sometimes in our other classes, they're so multidimensional or content-based that it can be challenging to try to focus on this to the, to the best possible level. Right, uh -oh. right. And, you know, yeah. um, I, I often think they're one of my favorite books uh, that, that, that 
recent, well, a while ago, but it, it haunts me. And it's the one thing. And it, it, it just, it, that, the, even the title of the book just comes back to me because every semester, almost every semester, or very often I go, okay, what's just one thing I could do? Right. So, so obviously there's a lot, but I think breaking it down and just going, okay, what's one thing I could experiment with this semester? Um, but to your point, certainly more training is, is needed. Patrick? You had a comment? Yes, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thanks again for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I loved um, seeing that chart that aligns a learning objective verbs with uh, instructional building blocks. I took a screenshot of that and that that's indispensable. I have a two part question, if you don't mind, it's not gonna be very sure. long, but um, uh, these two things are connected. Um, well, first of all, I'm wondering, uh, this has been one, one of my my own personal biggest challenges in teaching okay. super segmentals. How do I help my students interface between their explicit knowledge of prosody rule of the rules of prosody and being able to apply them in spontaneous speech? And what I mean by that is, um, you know, when I work with very advanced students and we we look at the, the actual scripts of their presentations. And you know, when we mark scripts and, and, and they divide things up and, and function words, content words, and then read a sentence that they've marked that way, uh, they sound great. But then they, they're, they're having a hard time developing this sort of intuition where they can do the marking in their head in spontaneous speech when they're, when they're just having a conversation with someone. So I'm wondering how to help them reach that sort of um, automaticity. Um, and at the same time, and this is the second part of my question, how would we write down an SLO for something like that? You know, like when I'm not really teaching anything explicit because they already know the explicit rules, um, but you know, I'm trying in my lesson, I'm trying to uh, help them become more automatic in their ability to, to um, apply the rules of prosody. Well, let me go backwards. Um, I think the, the, the second part of your question, the SLO would be, um, I mean, the verb would be something like practice, um, but the key thing would be the condition, right? Because it's not a prepared speech. The condition is in spontaneous conversation or in, in, a, in a small talk situation, for example. Um, and uh, in terms of they can do something in, you know, explicit knowledge and apply it to very contained uh, thing, I mean, that in and of itself is awesome, right? Okay, that's a huge achievement. The automaticity, um, I, would, I would be asking um, a lot of questions about the scaffolding process, because what you're actually practicing when you're, when you're doing that is you're not practicing any elements, you're practicing of them getting good at the script. Right, you're marking the script. You're practicing the script. Um, it's it's not actually facilitating a process um, that would transfer. So um, a couple of questions, right? And, and these are all like regular things. I'm sure you're already doing these things. Um, but uh, having lots of listening. So so you you mentioned that intuitive feeling of where to pronounce, where to stress. So um, there's been research and, and, and practice tells me that students who um, will listen to things, podcasts, audiobooks, a great deal and focus not on the content, but focus on where, you know, first time listen to the content, so interesting. Uh, the second time, so lots and lots of listening to, to implicit and take advantage of implicit learning. We don't necessarily, after you have explicit learning, you take advantage of the implicit learning environment in doing that. Um, the other thing I would say is the, I would want to look at your overall scaffolded process within the curriculum. So for example, you know, have they, um, do they also practice spontaneous speaking? Do you do a role play of small talk and can they monitor and use you know, key stress and have intonation while they're just doing a very small, small talk situation. Um, how much mirroring do you do, right? So are, so mirroring is gonna get 
all of those elements kind of more automated. Um, it doesn't, uh, it, it is another step. It doesn't mean that they comply it um, because it is their own spontaneous speech, but it is, is a stepping stone. So, so I would say um, more scaffolding um, and different activities that get them out of not just practicing the, the mark script, but monitoring and um, noticing their own speech. And I have, I have students or clients who um, we look at, they, they look at their schedule and they decide um, when they have the bandwidth to monitor their speech. So if they're just walking into their lab and they're going to say hi and they're going to chit chat with people, that's a time when they can try to use their new voice. And their new voice is right. They're 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 built. They're, it's based on um, a mirroring activity that we do. Like a, I call it the Bill Gates activity. They're mirroring and monitor, doing Bill Gates. So you have now a Bill Gates voice. So use your Bill Gates voice in different contexts. Um, so yeah, that scaffolding I think is is huge. That's very helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, just to clarify, by mirroring, uh, are you talking about shadowing? Uh, yes. at all okay yes yeah sorry yes sure yeah i know there's many terms for that i'm just the the, the yeah mm -hmm. shadowing okay yeah that's that's my favorite i actually did a a, a top event on shadowing here a couple of weeks back i love shadowing. Nice oh sorry patrick <laughs> um but like I said, that doesn't, shadowing is great, but it doesn't apply again to spontaneous speech because they have to generate right. the speech and there's lots of other things going on. So that's, there's another next, next level, right? Next, next challenge. Um, Christina? Yeah, just very quickly. Thanks a lot. I also liked, you know, the, the process of aligning the verbs with the building, five building blocks. And I was wondering whether you based it on Bloom's taxonomy or, you know, what was your primary source for choosing the uh, well, verbs? The verbs, I did go to Bloom's taxonomy mm -hmm. and, um, and you I have never, it. Mm. I, I don't know if anyone, I'd love to hear if anyone, I, I, I hadn't seen, I never saw this. Um, and I thought, wow, how useful that would be <laughs> to have verbs that would help us really focus in on the things that yeah. we already know this, that support. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I started with Bloom's taxonomy, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's super important. I'm so happy that you did that. Super important to start with the objectives and still our students have problems formulating the right objectives and they get distracted by nice activities without you know having set the right objective so they focus more on doing an activity without knowing what they like their students to achieve so i i yeah. think i think, it's, I think yeah i think that's yeah, a general it's often un underestimated in, yeah. in pronunciation teaching and learning there's lots of fun activities um, and I think they're, they might be appropriate for certain ages, certain levels. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need, you know, raise the energy in the class. But I, I think, I, I do think if we want, we also want to be effective and, and taking a step back and really thinking about, well, why are we doing it? And what does that actually achieve? <laughs> um, so, yeah. 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 And, uh, cool. Just the last question. Go Could ahead. Tell us yes. about the chapter you've mentioned that you are, or you've, you've written, uh, about your research, you know, yeah. when and, and, you know, will it be published or, um, you don't know. I to, well, I have to say, um, so this is um, John Levis. Um, do you remember the name of it, Marcia? So it's John Levis, Tracy Derwing and um, Senep. Uh, are the editors and it probably it will come out in within a year, I would say. Okay, so there's it's about still, 13 chapters general. and they're all mm. focused on um, pronunciation. There's one on technology, one on classroom research. Yeah, some good juicy stuff coming out. Um, the chapter, just a little bit about the chapter. So we started with some of those meta language or meta analysis articles, um, Saito and um, Thompson and Derwing. Okay. Uh, and yeah. So from there, we just said, okay, this is what they've looked at. Explicit instruction works. Let's go in and now look at um, what's happened in the last five years. So we did a lit review and what's happened in the last five years, classroom research. Mostly it's ESL. We tried to find other languages. It was very tough to find pronunciation, really good rigorous studies on pronunciation from other languages. So it's mostly ESL, but um, we did kind of comb and come like, read them meticulously and try to identify what was the, the theoretical underpinning of the study. Did they have one? Um, so that's where the, the theory came part that came out. Um, and then what was the instruction like? So we were really zooming in. I don't think that's been done before in, in the studies where they really looked at, well, 
and the descriptions actually the problem is it is it is problematic because journals have a little very little space you have a limit so the descriptions of what they actually do are a little bit vague sometimes you're as a teacher and especially you're like well how did they do that what information did they give them so it, it was a little bit challenging but like I said, the five of the five, uh, those five instructional building blocks were themes, you know, it was kind of a, a thematic analysis. So um, yeah, that will be coming out should be in about a year. We, we, the second drafts are through. <laughs> Thank you, looking forward to reading it. Yeah, great. Um, I guess I could also sell, say shameless self promotion. Um, also coming out if, if any of you um, are interested in phonetics and, and um, pronunciation crossroads, there is the um, frontier uh, communications in language, and it's a special a special issue, a special edition. It's online. Um, I can I can uh, send it to to Marsha and maybe blast it out to the top group, uh, but it's. An article. I have an article in there that connects kind of the segmentals and super segmentals. There's two articles, one on vowel quality and one on intonation, and I try to make a connection through um, prosodic hierarchy and prosodic features, but it kind of proposes a way of teaching. Um, so any feedback would be great. We're all just trying to take a stab and moving to the next level. <laughs> great. That's uh, super. I, I think we, we will definitely be able to uh, share out after our session. I just really, really want to give a big hand to uh, Allison. And if you'd like to take your mics uh, and put them in uh, in a clapping sound, so we can tell her how much we appreciate the uh, workshop that she presented today. Uh, and uh, we've got we've got our walking papers. We need to make our SLO. We need to think what is it that we are trying to teach our students, not, oh, what activity can we do, which is so common. Oh, what do we do tomorrow? But think about what is it we want to try to achieve and help our students learn? And can we narrow it down to some aspect? And if we're narrowing it down in our pronunciation field to super segmentals, which is only a part of pronunciation and speaking and listening, right? We take a little part of it and we say, call this the super segmental part and then tease it down into who is our audience? What do they already know? What are some things, some things that we want, would like to help them achieve, narrow it down and then give the conditions of, uh, under which we are going to try to measure achievement. Whew, I'm tired already. How about you? <laughs> thank Great. you so much for happy friday everybody to thank the you four. i want thank to you, remind Martha. you about our con our conference not everything is scheduled mm -hmm. i'm on the conference committee is set member benefits we've talked about before we just love it at katisa we hope that you all come back for more and one more round of applause for dr mcgregor thank you so much i will end the meeting now <laughs>